last video, we were talking about the minor region, but now it's time to focus on Europe. This time I picked eight teams to talk about in depth, and then I have a few more in the lightning round. So without further ado, let's get into it. Oh, and also I was just joking when I said minor region, so don't kill me for that, please. So it feels kind of weird to include Vitality here after how the qualifiers went for them, but I already had this section written out, so I'm just going to include it anyways. Vitality is probably in one of the most awkward positions that you can be in as an ROCS team. They already signed the young prodigy Zen to be a part of their team, but he can't play until spring. So they're going to go through the first two splits of the season with a temporary roster until Zen is finally eligible to come in and take somebody's spot. But for now on the starting roster, they have Sizen, who actually played alongside Radosin for most of the past two seasons. Sizen is easily one of the most aggressively positioned players in the entire region, being first in time spent as farthest forward and third in time spent in the offensive third. And as a part of that aggressive style, he was third in demos per game and first in boost stolen by a very wide margin. And the most interesting part about the style is that he would do it while not being near the ball that often, which isn't something that you see that often from a player that spends this much time on the offensive side of the field. So Sizen basically brought the term off-ball offense to a new extreme. And while Sizen would be upfield being aggressive, Radosin was the complete opposite, playing a very control style that included him making a lot of passes and playing a lot of defense. But he plays the style very well, slowing the play down whenever he needs to, being very patient on the ball, and being one of the best goal line defenders in Europe. This might be a kind of bold comparison to make because I think Ocal is a much better player, but it's very hard to not see the similarities in how they both play. And just like Khaled, Radosin being the safety net behind his teammates gives them the ability to be a lot more confident on the ball when they commit to making a play, which contributed a lot to Sizen's aggressiveness last season. And there might not be a single player who would benefit from having a guy like Radosin behind him than Alpha 54. Alpha is still one of the most skilled players in the entire region, and until Zen's able to play, he'll be the one that they look to most often to make something happen on offense. It's a role that he's had for a while now, but we also haven't seen Vitality have too much team success while he's doing that. And if how they performed in the qualifiers is any indication, that's probably not going to change. Trying to make an official prediction for this team is kind of weird, because we know ahead of time that there will be two different versions of this team that will take the field for Vitality this season. So for the version without Zen, even though they missed the first regional, I don't think that they'll miss too many more while they're together. And I think that they might even find their way into the top 10 at some point. But in the spring split, if Zen comes in and plays as well as a lot of people expect him to, then this team will be right back in the fight for major spots. But we still have a while until we get there, so I'll talk more about that when the time comes. The European Rocket League is always more fun when there's a full Spanish team wreaking havoc against the other top teams in the region. But unfortunately, that's not something we had for most of the last season. The old team Queso roster of Atomic, Dementa, and VK Salen filled that void during RCS X, but after they split up in the fall split of this season, nobody stepped in to fill the void. But now, Spanish Rocket League is back in the RLCS, and with the team that G1 has put together, it could very well be better than ever. The most exciting part of this team has to be Mark by 8, as he returns to a starting role after being benched by BDS going into the spring split of last season. Mark's most important job for BDS was on defense, as he would always look to challenge opponents as soon as they got the ball to make their life as difficult as possible when they are trying to move up on offense, which would slow down their advance and give Monkey Moon time to rotate back into the goal to play his goal line defense which is good because goal line defense isn't really something that Mark does. But on top of his defense, he's really good on offense too, even if he would get overshadowed by Monkey Moon most of the time. His production decreased last season compared to RLCSX, as he seemed to become less involved in the offense as the season went on. But I'm excited for him to show that his offensive abilities haven't gone anywhere in this new team environment. And running alongside Mark by 8 to create havoc for the defense will be Dorito, one of the speediest players in the entire region, who spent a lot of his career to this point alongside CRR. His former teammate often took a lot of the spotlight away from Dorito, but that was kind of hard to avoid because CRR was one of the brightest up and coming stars in the entire region last season. But Dorito was far from an afterthought, because on top of his speed, he was also one of the most accurate shooters in Europe. And now that he's no longer playing with the ball dominant CRR, this season will likely give him more opportunities to prove that he can maintain that great efficiency on even more shooting opportunities. Then you have Atomic, who kind of goes against that typical Spanish style that you see in a lot of players. In a country that is defined by players who are constantly moving around and causing chaos for the other team, Atomic instead does most of his damage with precision and waiting for the right moment to strike. You can see that in his scoring, because he's one of the best shooters in Europe, being near the top of the region in goals per game for each of the past two seasons now. While the typical Spanish style might be constant ball pressure and aggression, Atomic was most often the one who would be the payoff after all that pressure, ensuring that the team actually got something for all their effort. And his save totals suggest that he'll also be the one who will cover for them on defense when that aggression goes too far and the possession doesn't go their way. Being exposed to counterattacks is the obvious downside to the aggressive style that this team is likely to have. So having Atomic back there as a safety net will be very important for this team's success. That's why I thought he was the most important player for his old team Queso roster, 
and why I think he'll once again be the most important player for G1 this season. With the race for the major spots being so tight this season, G1's probably going to have their work cut out for them if they want to qualify, but I think that they'll make it to at least one of them, and they should be in good position to make it to the World Championship at the end of the season. Evil Geniuses is one of the most interesting teams in the RLCS. In a game that prioritizes speed and aggression over anything else most of the time, EG goes in the opposite direction by being much more methodical and slow paced than any other team that we have at the top level, with Catalyst and Rizx both being in the top 10 in slow average speed, and Rizx actually being number 1 in that stat. This playstyle resulted in the team allowing and scoring some of the fewest goals out of all teams in the region, and it worked out pretty well for them, but probably not quite as well as they would have hoped. They did end up qualifying for one major last season, making it in the winner split, but they ended up being just 30 points shy of qualifying for the World Championship, losing out on that spot to Semper. But with their new roster heading into this season, they're in good shape to improve on their performance from last year. The success of this team starts with Catalyst, who was their best offensive player last season, leading the team in both goals and assists. When I last talked about him, before the start of last season, I mentioned how much I loved his ability to change speeds when he was on the ball and how he was able to control the pace of play however he wanted to to give himself the best chance of breaking down the defense. If he had to speed things up, then he would, but if he was able to take his time, then he was most likely going to. He's the main reason why the slow pace style even works for this team in the first place, and I'm willing to bet that we see that continue coming into this season. But if Catalyst was this team's best offensive player, it wasn't by much, because Ivan was right there with him in just about every stat, proving that he was just as capable of putting points on the board as his teammate. He was the most aggressive player in terms of positioning, but on this team that's not really saying much. And in his case, more aggressive positioning didn't necessarily lead to a more aggressive style, because he had the fewest demos per game in the entire region last season, with his teammates not that far behind him. And even with how little aggression this team shows, they still spend a pretty decent amount of time on the offensive side of the field, which isn't the case for the new player that's coming onto the team, Tox. He's a more defensive player in the typical sense, that being making more saves and spending a lot more time on the defensive side of the field. So on a team that already has a slow-paced defensive style, Tox could turn into the defensive specialist for them. It's very rare for a team to do that well without having some form of aggression. But if there's a team that would be able to pull it off, it's this one. And they've already gotten off to a good start by making it through the top 16 qualifier without a loss, including taking a win over BDS. They're right there in the next group of teams who are looking to break into the top 5 and qualify for the major spots. And while they are currently just outside of that top 5 in my opinion, they might have a better chance than anyone else to eventually get in there by the end of the season. Moist come into this season as one of the most talented teams in all of Europe. They have Ryze and Joyo, who both made their first pro appearances during RCS X and then had their big breaks last season alongside Vatira. And then you also have Astro, who's always been recognized as an extremely mechanical player ever since he started playing back in Season 8. And honestly, those mechanics have only gotten better with time. If I was judging this team off of that talent alone, then I'd probably have them even higher up on this list. But bringing in Astro to replace Vatira honestly gives me some concerns, especially on defense. On top of being this team's most balanced player, Vatira was this team's best and most frequent defender. Ryze is one of the most aggressive players in the entire region, as he was second in EU in time spent in the offensive third, and 7th in time spent as being farthest forward, and this aggression would show up for him while he was both on the ball, taking and making a lot of shots for the team, and off the ball, where he'd be stealing boosts and doing opponents to clear the way for his teammates. Then you have Joyo, who was probably the most mechanical player on the team last season, and he would spend about as much time as he could showing off those mechanics, being up in the air more often than almost anybody else in the region. And while Joyo actually spent more time in the third man position than Vatira, that didn't translate into him getting nearly as many saves because Vatira was still this team's go-to goalie. And while Joyo is of course a capable defender, he's definitely not a defensive-minded player. And Astro is honestly pretty similar to Joyo, in the fact that he would spend a lot of time up in the air with the ball, and with the fact that he spent a good amount of time as third man, but still wasn't very defensive. But in Astro's case, saying that he's not very defensive as third man doesn't really do it justice, because he would dive in a lot of the time from that position to go for really aggressive challenges in an effort to keep their offensive possession going, but would leave his team very susceptible to counterattacks if it didn't work out. And the play that I talked about in my video after the World Championship is a perfect example of this. This was also a big reason for K-Corp struggling defense until they brought in Nali, who helped balance out that extreme. This is where my concern is for this team, because without that more frequent defender like Fatira or Nali on the team to back them up when they push up on offense aggressively, these players could find themselves in a lot of tough situations on defense. If I had to guess, I'd say that Joyo will be the one backing off and playing defense more often, but if he does do that, that'll just take away from the great impact he can have on the ball on offense. So I'm curious to see how this team navigates around this potential issue, and how they'll put all three of these really good players in the best spot for this team to have success. But with how talented this team is, even if my fear about their defense ultimately ends up being true, 
I still don't think that this team can finish anywhere below the top 6. This team is going to be one of the scariest for opponents to face for one simple reason. They're going to score, and they're going to score a lot. This team brings together three of Europe's top scorers from last season. Before they came together, they were all the go-to shooter for their respective teams. But now that they're on the same team, this means that they can literally go to any of them if they need to score. But even on a team full of great shooters, Joris has to stand out as the best of all of them. He was first in goals per game last season and fifth in shooting percentage, proving that no matter how many chances he's given, you can count on him to get the job done more often than anybody else. And while he did benefit from having a great setup man next to him and apparently Jack, who would consistently give him great shooting opportunities, even in scenarios when he wasn't given an easy shooting opportunity, he would still be able to make the most out of it. For Ole, he had a bit of an up and down season last year in regards to both his team performances and individual play, but that really had more to do with the circumstances around him than it did his own form. In the fall split on Heroic, the team had an okay showing, making it to all the main events and finishing 12th that split. Then after Ole's offensive running mate, Tho, was replaced by Yukio, a more defensive player, they fell off drastically and didn't make it to a single main event in the winter. So after that, Ole decided to leave and look for a new team, and naturally, he decided to team up with Tho again, and he ended up having his best split, both in terms of individual performance and the team standings in the rankings. Tho is naturally a very aggressive and offensive player, and because of that, defenses would need to worry about him just as much as they did Ole, which ended up taking some of the pressure off Ole and gave him more space for his shooting chances. But now, instead of Tho, he has Jorius and Archie, who both demand much more attention from the defense than Tho did. So it's not too crazy to think that Ole could look better on this team than he has at any point during his RLCS career. Archie is also just as good of a scorer as both of his new teammates, but the biggest difference with him is that we see him on the other side of the field making saves just as often as we see him taking shots. Ever since he came into the RLCS at the beginning of Season X, he's always had a pretty hard carry style where he takes as many of the key touches for his team as he can, both on offense where he's taking the final touch of the possession looking to take a shot, and on defense where he's rotating into net and looking to make the clutch save. But this always worked out really well for him and his teams because he's really good at doing both of those things. Because of that tendency to rotate out of the play and straight back to their own goal to play defense, I think that Archie is going to be this team's primary defender most of the time, and I think that he'll be the one to make sure that opponents don't score off of counterattacking chances most often, which could turn out to be a very important job given how much all these players like to play offense. With how much talent this team has, I don't think that they'll finish anywhere outside of the top 5, and I think that they'll make it to at least 2 of the majors, if not all 3. And I'm also willing to bet that this team will be the best offense in terms of goals per game by the end of the season. Pretty much every team that sees success in the RLCS has at least one player with significant pro experience, and most of them have two. Even teams that are exceptions to this rule, like last year's Moist team, still have at least some RLCS experience behind them. Joyo played in two events during the spring of RLCS X, and Ryze played in eight events. And while Viteria was brand new heading into last season, this team still had a little bit of experience before they came into last season. And even in their case, it still took them getting through a pretty mediocre fall split before they really rounded into form and became one of the best teams in the world during the winter. This is what makes Team Liquid last year such a unique case, because they came into the spring split with two players who had literally no RLCS experience, and it took them pretty much no time at all to become one of the best teams in the region, as they qualified for the spring major in their first split together. The scariest part about this is that teams that are this young and inexperienced always see steady improvement as they spend more time together, just like we saw with Moist last season. So if Liquid's able to make significant improvements from last season when they were already really good, then they're going to be very hard for anybody to deal with this season. All three of these players are really skilled, really mechanical, and really, really fast. You can't pay extra attention to any one of them because their teammates are just as likely to make you pay if you give them the chance. And because of this, all three players had very similar production to one another, with very small differences between them in nearly every stat. This includes being next to each other in shots per game, with Atto surprisingly having the fewest on the team, despite being the farthest forward more than either of his teammates. He also spends the most time as closest to the ball on the team and steals the most boost, serving as the team's primary initiator of the offensive attack most often. On the opposite side, Akronik was the most conservative player on the team in terms of how close he was to the ball, while also being the team's number one scorer. He takes a lot of his shots after the other team has already been put in a tough spot by his teammates, and he looks to be the one to finish off the possession with a goal more often than he looks for another pass, as shown by having the lowest assist total on the team and one of the lowest in the entire region. And Oski fit right between the more aggressive Atto and the more conservative Akronik, while being the team's and the region's fastest player and leading his team in assists. But despite the very subtle tendencies that these players show, they all have shown that they can excel in any area of the field consistently, and that balance and versatility in their skill sets is probably their greatest weapon. 
I wouldn't be surprised if this team ended the season as the best in Europe, as they get more and more experience as the season goes on. But while they may or may not eventually reach that peak, I can't see this team finishing anywhere outside of the top 3. It isn't very often that you see a team make such a drastic roster move after finishing the season in better form than they had shown all season. But that's exactly what K-Corp chose to do when they removed Astral and Nali from the team, leaving Itachi as the only holdover going into next season. Typically, making a move like this would be a sign of trouble, but with the players that they managed to replace them with, that isn't the case for this team at all, with Exotic and the young superstar Vatira coming in to fill out this roster for the upcoming season. And with this squad, I like their chances to continue the positive momentum that they ended last season on. Exotic was a unique case last season, because during the fall split, he didn't even make it to the close qualifiers once, and he went through the entire winter split without even joining a team as far as I know. But despite not making an impact all season, he was picked up by Semper in the spring split after they loaned out Archie, and he showed that he still had it. He looked really good individually for that entire split, even if their poor team finishes meant that not many people were noticing. But it was impossible not to notice when he continued that good form into the World Championship, leading Semper through a clean sweep of the wildcard stage, winning all three of their series. He showcased great all-around offensive ability, finishing near the top of the region in goals and assists per game, and was the driving force of Semper's offensive attack after Archie's departure. And now that he's joining Carmine Corp, he'll be alongside the two best teammates that he's ever had in his time as a pro, which will give him even more chances to shine. One of those teammates is Itachi, the only player left on K-Corp's team from last season. He is still arguably the best passer in the region, after he was first in assists in RLCS X and was just outside the top 10 in that stat last season, probably due in large part to another great passer on the team, Astral, taking some of those opportunities for himself. But despite his decrease in assists, his tendency to be around the ball was as high as ever, as he led the region in closest average distance to the ball. His being around the ball so often caused some problems for the team defensively at the beginning of last season, especially considering how close Astro liked to be to the ball too. But those problems were mitigated by Nali joining the team and providing them more spacing. So while it could have been possible for Itachi and Exotic to have the exact same spacing issues that affected the team last season, the other new player on the team is likely to make sure that that's never an issue. Vatira is, justifiably, a lot of people's pick for the best player in the entire world after he was named the European MVP last season. He was the most consistent player for Moist, as well as being the most well-rounded in his skill set. He was also the most defensive player for Moist last season, getting the most saves on the team and the 11th most in the region. But he also showed that he was just as good of a shooter as he was a defender, and he showed how involved he would be in the play all the time by having one of the highest average game scorers in all of Europe. So with Itachi and Exotic being two of the best passers in the region, Vatira is the perfect player to either take shots off of those passes or recover back to their own net and make saves if their possession goes wrong. This team is going to be very good and will likely be in the fight for the top spot in Europe all season. But at the very least, I think that they'll solidly be within the top three, alongside Team Liquid and the final team in the season preview. Monkey Moon is the best player in the world, and he's been in the conversation for that title for the last two seasons now. But a lot of people have had a really solid claim to it. Even before this season, when the question came up of who the best in the world was, three of the names that came up most often were Yan, TRK, and Vatira. And then of course you still have First Killer, who's always right there too. But when you look at individual skill, versatility on the field, and team results, there probably isn't a single player who has a better resume than Monkey Moon since the beginning of RLCS X. Which means that Monkey Moon has been dominating for about two years now, which might as well be an eternity in Rocket League. There aren't many players who have managed to play this well for this long, and he's already put himself in the conversation for being one of the best European players of all time. But if he dominates again this season, and is able to lead BDS to even more land wins, and continues to play up to the standard of being called one of the best in the world for the third year in a row, then I personally might be ready to call him the best of all time. Three years of dominance against some of the toughest competition in RLCS history, which is only getting tougher as time goes on, is something that I won't be able to look past. Especially if he keeps up the insane form that he had last season, where he was top 5 in goals, assists, and saves in the region. Being the only player who is even close to accomplishing that, he can do everything on the field, has no real weaknesses, and it seems like he's ready to lead BDS to yet another dominant season. The only thing that you could do to make a player like Monkey Moon even scarier is pair him up with someone who commands just as much respect when they have the ball. And that's exactly what BDS got when they picked up Seiko at the start of the spring split. After coming into the season on Team Endpoint as an unknown for a lot of people, he immediately showed the world how good he was, helping his team to qualify for both the Fall and Winter Majors. But even after putting up crazy stats for Team Endpoint, his production only went up after he joined BDS. And after a pretty uncharacteristic bad showing in the Spring Major, he found his form again in time for Worlds, and played well enough to be named the World Championship MVP. After having arguably the best rookie season in RLCS history, I'm excited to see what he does for an encore. But while Monkey Moon and Seiko are the two stars of this team, 
Extra is the engine that makes sure everything is running smoothly. Monkey Moon may get the most saves on the team, but in my opinion, Extra is their best defender, even with the low number of saves that he always has. With the way that he's able to slow down opponents' counterattacks without much help through his early challenges and shadow defense, he makes life way easier for his teammates as they rotate back to goal. And with Seiko and Monkey Moon doing so much work on offense and committing to that side of the field so often, it's a situation that Extra finds himself in pretty often. His ability and willingness to do the dirty work for this team so often, which allows his teammates to shine even brighter, says a lot about the player and person that he is, and I don't think BDS would be able to function nearly as well if they didn't have him. The roster shuffle that happened in Europe this offseason put together some really good teams that will all have their chance to take down BDS. But as far as I know, Monkey Moon doesn't play for any of those teams. And as long as that's the case, BDS has to be the favorite in Europe. Alright, time for the lightning round again. Same drill as last video. I have a few more teams to talk about, and I'm going to try to give them two or three sentences each. But I'm probably going to fail and say more than that, because I don't know how to stop talking. For the third season in a row, the duo of Arju and Matane come into the season with a new third alongside them. In RCS X, the player that they had alongside them was Ixo, for the first two splits at least before they replaced him with Bluey, and then last season they had Cash. In both of those seasons, Ixo and Cash were the go-to offensive players for those teams, while Arju and Matane played a more supportive role, especially so in Matane's case. Now they come into the season with Smokes, who I know nothing about, but if I had to guess, he's probably another mechanical player that they'll look to to provide some spark on offense. And it's worked out really well for them so far, as they qualify for the main event through the top 16 qualifier. Arju and Matane have always found a way to be really competitive, and I don't think that'll change this season. Solary is going to be very fun to watch this season, because we have three Rocket League legends who are teaming up and trying to prove that they still have what it takes to compete against the best players that this region has to offer. And I honestly think that they still have it in them. Recently, they've all taken a more supportive role to try to back up their more mechanical teammates, and this was especially true for Kadop and Chaussette. But now that they're all together, they won't be able to do this as much anymore. I'm guessing that Chaussette will be the one out of these two players to move up more often, because Kadop's kind of used to being in a farther back position, which allows him to be in a good spot to receive passes and show off his great shooting. I doubt that any of these three players return to the form that made them some of the best players in the world, but regardless, I think that they'll still be a pretty good team. Williams Resolve was coming into the season as one of the most underrated teams in the entire region, but after holding their own in the toughest possible lineup in the top 16 qualifier, and then 3 owing their way through the close qualifier, they're not very underrated anymore, because people know how good they are. Flame and Breezy have stuck together after a pretty decent season last year under 00 Nation, and they brought in Noah Saki, who's still a bit of an unknown. He played for Heroic in the spring split of last season, but they weren't able to make it to any main events. But if he keeps up his performance from the qualifiers, then he's going to be a really good scorer for this team, which should honestly be perfect because I've always thought that Flame is a really good passer. So expect this team to get even more upsets as the season goes along. I'm pretty optimistic about top blokes this season, because if there's one thing you can count on, it's for a team that has Cassio to outperform expectations. He did it when he qualified for the Season 7 and 8 World Championships under Triple Trouble and Veloce respectively, and he did it again in RLCS X when Top Blokes finished third in the region despite not having much expectations going into it. Now with the patient and methodical Rizex on his team, and the unproven Raziers getting ready for his first ever RLCS main event, Cassio's probably going to have to shoulder a pretty large burden for this team to have success. But if he stays as consistent and dependable as he always has been, then I don't think that'll prove to be too much of an issue for this team, and they should be a consistent presence in main events this season. And finally, we have the Sonics. Thoen and Mike Boy ended last season with Ole on the team, who's one of the best offensive players in the region. But now heading into this season, they have Mets Norris on their team, who does have plenty of skill on his own, but you're very unlikely to see him take over the game in the same way that Ole could. Last season, we had most often see Tho prioritizing putting pressure on the defense, and the main way that he would do this was to take a lot of shots, not necessarily expecting them to go in, but just trying to wear the opponents down more and more over time until one of his teammates was ready to deliver the final blow, with that teammate most of the time being Ole. But now that he doesn't have a clinical shooter like that to finish off plays for him, he'll likely need to take on a lot more of the scoring burden himself. But they're also going to need a lot of contribution from Mike Boy and Mets Norris if they're going to make up for the lost production. But I think that this team is experienced enough and skilled enough to make consistent appearances in main events this season. And with that, my 2022-23 season preview is all wrapped up. These two videos took way longer to make than I thought they would, and I'm kind of tired now. So I'm going to go take a nap, but I hope to see you all in the next one. And of course, thanks for watching.